Hi, this is Scott Wilkinson, host of Home Theater Geeks. In episode 331, I chat with Leo Katzenellenson and Anthony Ang about a new type of projection screen from their company, Luminate. So stay tuned. Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for Home Theater Geeks is provided by Cashfly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. This is Home Theater Geeks with Scott Wilkinson, recorded November 28th, 2016, for December 1st. Episode 331 A New Type of Projection Screen. This episode of Home Theater Geeks is brought to you by CuriosityStream, a subscription streaming service that offers over 1,500 documentaries and non-fiction series from the world's best filmmakers. Get unlimited access starting at just $2.99 a month. And for our audience, the first two months are completely free if you sign up at curiositystream.com slash twit and use the offer code twit. And by Epson's new EcoTank printers. With Epson's line of SuperTank all-in-one printers, you can print thousands of documents without running out of ink. EcoTank is loaded and ready to print when you are. Visit epson.com slash ecotank to find out more. And by Optical Cables by Corning. Corning's incredibly durable Thunderbolt and USB 3-point optical cables are longer, thinner, lighter, and stronger. Go to opticalcablesbycorning.com to learn more. Hey there, Scott Wilkinson here, the home theater geek and editor of avsforum.com. This week, I have two guest geeks from a company called Luminate. Uh, one is Leo Katzenellenson, VP of Engineering. Leo, welcome to the show. Hi there, good to be here. Uh, it's great to have you with us. Also, Anthony Ang, a senior optical engineer at Luminate. Anthony, thank you so much for being here. Thank you for inviting us. Well, I'm sure glad to have you here. We got something really interesting to talk about today. But before we do, I want to make sure that those who are watching live at live.twit.tv can join the chat room there or at irc.twit.tv. And you can post questions as we go. I'll be looking at the chat room and I'll pass along as many as I can. It always helps if you put my screen name, which is my name, Scott Wilkinson, no dots or dashes, into the message, anywhere in the message, and that way it shows up in a different color on my screen and I can more easily see it. So we're going to be talking about projection screens today, but, at, but the first thing I'd like for you guys to answer is tell us something of the history of this company, Luminate. I had not heard of it before, CE, uh, Cedia, where you were uh, for, I guess, the first time uh, with a with a projection screen, but Luminate is not a, a company that just started. You guys have been around for a while, right? That's true. So, Leo, so, tell us a little bit about what uh, how, the history of Luminate and what what it has been involved in. Let's start with that. So, brief history of Luminate. Uh, there is three numbers uh, come to my mind: twenty, ten, and five. So, about twenty years ago company named Physical Optic Corporation, POC, here in Torrance, come up with the idea of a uh, light shaping diffuser. Uh, ten years after, Luminate was as a spin-off from that company. And probably most of the reasons why you never heard about Luminate because we was involved in government program called SBIR, Small Business Innovation Research. Uh, we wasn't much present in uh, consumer electronic market. Mm. So, what kind and, what kind of things did did Lum has Luminate been developing under this program? So, we was involved in uh, multiple technologies, all of them related to the main three fields. One was holography. Uh, one was uh, diffusion system, and some of the material science. So we have dozens of various projects, and um, all those projects lead to the almost 2,000 different 
products based on one fundamental technology, which is light shaping diffusers. So and tell us tell us about light shaping diffusers then. What what exactly are they? What are they used for typically? I know we're going to get into how they're used with projection screens, but before that, sort of a basic definition of what is a light shaping diffuser. So I will ask probably Anthony is the best person to answer that question. Okay. So light shaping diffusers are formed holographically. And what they do is they take, um, if you shine light, like a laser light, to a light shaping diffuser, it will spread out the light. So diffuse the light. That's where the word diffuser comes from. Mm -hmm. It'll diffuse the light out into space. Hmm. Okay, and why, why would one want to do that? Well, recently, what happened was that um, LEDs became brighter and brighter. So since they've become more and more uh, popular in use because of their efficiency and brightness, um, very intense LED light will be too much for people to see. It'll be way too bright. So in order to reduce that um, very intense light, you need to put a diffuser in front of it to break up the light so it's more pleasing to the eyes to see. Mm -hmm. So would this be, for example, in uh, street lights or, um, you know, stoplights, red, red, green, and yellow stoplights that use LEDs now? Um, it could be used for that, but um, with for those, example, I don't think they're used there, but more of um, like, let's say, museum lights, uh, stage lighting, where a lot of the actors will see uh, plenty of light, but they want need, wanted to break up the light so it's out further, you know, into a bigger area, which would reduce the intensity of the light that appears to their eyes. Mm. And uh, on your website, uh, there's an interesting phrase when, when we're talking about what Luminate does. It says, light shaping diffusers formed by, by holographic process, quote, pseudo-random surface relief microstructures. Wow, that's a mouthful. <laughs> <laughs> what does that mean? Okay, let me okay, explain let me and break, explain it break it down. Can we have, can uh, we have a graphic of Yes, we can. In fact, here's one of several graphics we're going to show today. Uh, tell us about what we're looking at here. Okay, so to explain the whole phrase, I have to break it up into several words. Okay, yes. So pseud Pseudo-random. Okay, let's go with, start with that one. Mm -hmm. Okay, so it's kind of an oxymoron um, because... Yeah, it's, it's, either, it's either random or it isn't, right? Right, right. So pseudo-random, the reason we use that is that it's controlled chaos. Okay, so that's where it's oxymoron. And you could see that the surface is very random looking, and that creates a scattering that we're looking for. Mm. And what we're calling controlled is that the overall pattern is a very controlled uh, pattern and it typically looks Gaussian. I don't know if uh, the whole audience knows what that means, but probably not. About, so let's define it. Okay, so if you think about your grading system, everyone's in a bell shaped curve. So that basically the normal curve is a Gaussian curve. So our diffuser overall pattern will become Gaussian looking. Okay. Okay. Right. The so there's, some, there's something. There's something about it that has a a bell curve kind of shape to it. Yeah, that's that's not the surface shape, but what it projects out when you shine a laser light onto it. Ah, it ah, ah okay. So going back, so in other words, having light reflect straight back or straight through, in the case of a transmissive material, it'll be strongest. And then as, as you go off axis, it gets less and less in the form of a bell curve. Yes. Okay. Okay. So uh, and then the number part. six. Yeah, number six we have also. Let is that take a graphic here you put up? Yeah, yeah, we'll, we'll see that in a second. There it is. Okay, so you can see this more from the top. Okay, and what we'll explain next is the surface relief. So you can see on the left is a microscope shot of our diffuser. All right. Mm -hmm. And so you can see the randomness, and you can see it's kind of like. Uh, random hills in there with maybe water running through the through the bottom of it like a grand canyon through the gullies so see, yeah yes you can see rivers running through it 
So that's uh, very typical of our diffusers. So that is our surface relief. So think of it as a surface relief map, per mm -hmm. se. Yep. Okay. And the last yep. part, of course, is microstructures. So that says what the scale of these uh, structures are. It's down in the micron type scales. Okay. So, so put, put that really all tiny. together, and it'll be pseudo random surface relief microstructures. And these structures um, basically act uh, refractively with light to scatter the light in an overall envelope that looks uh, fairly Gaussian. So, okay, now we understand pseudo-random surface relief microstructures. The next question is, how does that relate to or apply to projection screens? How did all of this work that you've done oh, over the last uh, 20, 10, and five years, as Leo mentioned, uh, lead to projection screens? I'll let uh, Leo handle that part. Okay. So about five years ago, we um, tried some of the diffusers in reflective mode. And we actually see very surprising quality, uh, very effective reflection light, almost in the same pattern as a see-through. So we start thinking, hmm, that might be a good property, but the size of the samples we have is quite small. So in the past five years, we've been thinking to improve size, enlarge, and also improve quality and uniformity. Because three property of diffuser is very important for a reflection. One is the surface that you see is very smooth. So there is no breakage, there is no sharp corners. So life scatter in a very controllable manner. Second is continuous. So again, there is no gaps, there is no opening, so the l l light is coming back, is very nice. So or or we might say no seams. You, you can't really join pieces of material together because then you'd have a seam, right? At some point, we have to do the seams because... Uh, once we start working on the screen projects, we realize there is certain limit to the technology where you can make seamless. So if you make IMAX screen, you have to make joints. So mm. that's what we're working. And every screen that you see in the cinema have joints, actually, a lot of them. So we was working on a seamless concept. But initially, our goal was is to make continuous large rolls, which cover 80% of the screen uh, request and be seamless. So right now, that's what we can do. We can do up to 55 inch wide, thousand feet long rolls. <laughs> that's what I need, a 55 inch tall, thousand foot wide screen. <laughs> but what that means is you can really make any a screen of any size as long as it's limited to 55 inches tall. Right. Uh, but actually, right. <laughs> I like your comments. Um, there is a Tokyo Tower concept when they wrap whole room, which is round room, with our screen. Mm. Oh, really? No sim. Yes. <laughs> wow. And then how many projectors, I wonder, do they do they use to fill that whole thing? Bunch, I, I guess. A bunch. More than a dozen. Oh, wow. <laughs> Um, okay, so this new screen is what I really wanted to, to focus on today. And um, before we do, though, I would like to thank one of our sponsors for this episode. So if you'll give me just a moment, uh, I would like to thank Curiosity Stream, which is the world's first ad-free nonfiction streaming service. It was founded by John Hendricks, the founder of the Discovery Channel, one of my favorite channels on TV. It has over 1,500 titles or 600 hours of content, and over 50 of those hours is 4K. It's now available in 196 countries worldwide and on many platforms, including web apps, Roku, Android, iOS, Chromecast, Amazon Fire, Amazon Kindle, and Apple TV. There's a wide variety of science and technology content, plus nature, history, and many other topics, in addition to documentaries, they also have interviews and lectures. Now, the library includes a number of really interesting 
uh, programs, including Stephen Hawking's Favorite Places. This is a brand new exclusive documentary in which Stephen Hawking pilots a fantastical CGI spaceship across the universe, making stops at Saturn and many of his favorite destinations. I imagine a black hole must be in there as well. There's Digits, a groundbreaking three-part series hosted by Derek Muller, creator of YouTube science channel Veritasium, which explores online safety and security, a super important topic these days. The series features never-before-seen footage with former NSA contractor Edward Snowden and co-founder of the internet, Vince Cerf. There's also Deep Time History, one of my favorites, an exclusive three-part original documentary series that tells the story of the universe's 14 billion year history, including surprising twists to the stories you thought you knew. Finally, I'd like to point you to Underwater Wonders of the National Parks. In celebration of the National Park Service's centennial year, this exclusive seven-part series takes you on a journey below the bodies of water within America's national parks. Monthly and annual plans are available, with annual plans offering notable savings. These plans start at just $2.99 per month, less than a cup of coffee or the cost of one uh, title on those competing on-demand platforms. So check out curiositystream.com slash twit and use the promo code twit during sign-up to get unlimited access to the world's top documentaries and non-fiction series, completely free for the first 60 days. That's two entire months free of one of the largest non-fiction 4K libraries around. Just go to curiositystream.com slash twit and use the offer code twit at sign up. And we thank CuriosityStream very much for their support of home theater geeks. Okay, we're talking about a new projection screen that came derived out of the optical work done by a company called Luminet. And in fact, you've spun off a new division of the company, shall we say, called Crystal Screens. Great name, by the way. Um, and that's what's, that's what's the part of the company that's working on this projection screen technology, right? That's true. We just mm -hmm. moved to a new facility uh, a few weeks ago. Oh, cool. Um, and I believe the new screen material is called Reflect. Have I got that right? I guess that's what... Um, describe screen the most i think reflect is more like a gain of the screen mm. so the product name will be reflect for example 2.5 or reflect 4 which is translation of the gain of the screen mm -hmm. well we're going to talk a lot about gain here in a bit um but first i want to sort of just talk a little bit about the the construct how, how the screen is is Constructed, and we have a graphic uh, number one, and uh, let's take a look at that, which is shows the basic structure, which there's a substrate, and then there's a, a, a light diffuser, a light shaping diffuser, or LSD, uh, on the top of that. Uh, will one of you sort of tell us a little bit about each of these pieces? Okay, I can describe that. So if you look at, uh, it says rigid substrate, but um, you can actually use any type of substrate. This is just a graphic that was available. Um, so we have a substrate, and we lay on top of that our diffuser structure. So one of the advantages we have over um, many other type of diffusers is that since this, all the power of the diffusion comes from the surface shape, our surface shape can be transferred from one tool to another or to our final product. So since it's a surface relief microstructure, we can transfer the surface relief onto uh, a substrate. Mm -hmm. So the okay. substrate that uh, you see on that picture, probably one of the pictures uh, where we have a snapshot of our web production system. The substrate we use is a film. It, it can be transparent. Uh, normally we use polycarbonate film that um, available on the market today. Mm -hmm. and, and we print our structure right on the top of that 
uh, screen, which is called cast and cure roll to roll process. So once we finish that structure, which is on a diagram, the next step is to apply reflective layer right on the top of that structure, which is done by a physical vapor deposition process. And we have a large variety of um, reflective materials that we can apply. And the last year, uh, layer that invisible protective. So protective layer designed to make sure that screen will be more or less cleanable and uh, protect a reflective layer from oxidation. Mm -hmm. Now, so the reflective layer is deposited by a physical vapor deposition right. onto the top of this diffuser material with, with this pseudo-random microstructure, correct? Correct. Um, yes. So the, and the, the diffuser, the um, substrate layer, though, even though it looks pretty thick in that diagram, is actually quite thin, right? Well, yes, it can be anything anywhere from... 30 mils to couple mils, five mils material of choice. Mm -hmm. But compare, compare to the thickness of epoxy, which is less than 30 microns, and even much thinner layer of physical vapor deposition, it's look pretty thick. But yes, it's very thin, very flexible, uh, strong, optically grade film. Mm-hmm. One of the people I spoke to uh, from your company said that it was not unlike a mirror, an actual mirror, with a diffuser layer. Without the diffuser layer, it would look like a mirror. It would just, you know, you'd see your reflection in, like in a mirror. But the diffuser layer is what makes it appropriate as a projection screen. Is that about right? Yeah, that's about right. Because what you see is mirror on the top of the diffuser. It's perfectly reflective. If you have a, anywhere in the screen flat spot, you will see perfect mirror or perfect sparkle. Mm. So here's a picture of the same picture that we've got, but with light rays coming in. Right. And right. clearly we they call, get reflected in different directions because of the structure of this uh, uh, light shaping diffuser. Because uh, quasi pseudo none of them the same microstructure yeah, right. Create, uh, create very impressive uh, diffusion or reflective process. We call front surface first uh, reflective mm -hmm. phenomena. Now, so the light, the light doesn't bounce from each other. It just bounces from the surface going back. Right. As opposed to other companies, other screens that use different types of... of uh, diffusion material, and we have the next picture shows an example of that. Some companies use uh, actually tiny little glass beads on the surface of the, of the screen to diffract, the, diffuse the light, uh, but there's a problem there. What is it? Let, and we, as we look at this graphic, you can tell us what the problem is here. Okay, I can go over that. Mm -hmm. So if you look, as the light rays hit a single bead, you get multiple reflections and transmission points. Now, each time you go through a transmission, you're going to get some losses. Some of it's reflected. Uh, but uh, other things that can happen is absorption inside of the beads. And when you reflect off the backside, you don't necessarily get all of the reflection coming back. So because of the multiple reflections and transmission, uh, the efficiency is uh, not as high. I think right. there is a second factor to it, right? Uh, efficiency is uh, one of the major factors, but second is control. Uh, mm. Using glass beads or some industry using aluminum flakes, uh, you cannot control the light cone output, uh, which is our structures enable to have very controllable uh, cone of light coming back to the viewer. Mm. So, uh, yeah, efficiency, which really means how much of the light that hits the screen gets reflected back, how much of it is absorbed or lost in one way or another. 
and then control. How, how well can you control how the reflective characteristics work? And what you're saying uh, is that this light shaping diffuser gives you much more control than glass beads or aluminum flakes or anything along those lines. That's correct. Not to mention the fact that aluminum flakes have sharp edges. And we were talking yeah, earlier. That's Go called ahead. hot spots as a result of uh, flakes. Yeah, hot spots. And especially with high gain screens, such as the ones that, that I think you're mostly talking about, uh, which we're going to get to shortly. Uh, I want to take again a look at the screen surface. Uh, and so four, five, six, and seven. Uh, let's take a look at those images. We saw five, four and five again. Okay, here's a, uh, I guess this is a rendering, right? This is not an actual photograph. Yes, this is a rendering of the uh, diffuser surface. So uh -huh. what we've done at Luminet is I've come up with a modeling of this very complicated surface, the pseudo-random microstructure. And we figured out how to model this into, into the computer and what I do for some customers is that when they request um, either diffuser model or uh, Leo, when Leo requests for uh, more of these uh, screens that we're talking about, I can model this in a ray tracing program that's uh, standard in the industry. Mm, okay. Uh, moving on so, to the next. Sorry, you had something to say there, Leo? Yeah, this is a great capability because it used to take a uh, couple months from the mo from the second we figure out what we want to the second we make it and prove. Right now we can model in a matter of hours or days and we can predict with a very high degree of accuracy uh, what you're going to get from the box of chocolate. <laughs> not not you never know what you're going to get um this brings up that, that picture brings up in a question i have for you uh either of you uh which is it you leo you mentioned at the outset that one of the characteristics you need on a screen is something very smooth yes, uh, and yet this is doesn't look very smooth at least at that level of of magnification it's very bumpy um but is it smooth enough, I assume, at the at the range that you need, a, say, a projector coming, hitting it from where it is, many feet away, it, the screen must look smooth to it, right? It's kind of uh, semi-quizo, uh, smooth roughness. Smooth <laughs> roughness. I like it. That's great. So if you look at one of the first graphs that we have, which is we call SEM LSD surface, you will notice in a, such a large, relatively large area, you will see no cracks, uh, no sharp corners, no broken lines. That's mm -hmm. what we call smoothness. Let's go and to graphic number five, the next graphic, and see if we have that there. Uh, I don't think I have the exact one you're, you're thinking of. I didn't send that exact one. But if we go to the next one. Um, yeah. that, this look from the top. If you yeah. look closely, you will not see any sharp corners, any scratches, any broken lines. So that's what we call smooth surface. And mm -hmm. that's what makes screen react to projection light in a, such a uniform uh coherent and cohesive uh, manner. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then if we take a look at the next photo after that, next graphic after that, let's see what that looks like. Okay, here we go. Oh, actually, that's what I was talking about, right? Yeah, this is what you were talking about. Okay, so take us through with this one. Uh, Anthony can take you, glide right through it. Okay, so when I make these uh, diffusers in a holographic manner, I can control what the overall output angle that's going to come out um, through the structure shape. Okay, so you could see when you have a smoother surface for the five degree, um, it looks like calm waters and also 10 degrees. It's a little bit windy, but not, not too uh, choppy there. <laughs> so it looks like an ocean surface, right? Nice mm -hmm. calm wave on a nice uh, slightly breezy day, but not a heavily breezy day. 
And as you go higher angles, of course, you get higher and higher waves. Um, so you can see that we can control the amount of scatter by the surface structure. So and these, these, these. Let me make sure I understand this. These angles that that are labeling each of these pictures: five degrees, ten degrees, twenty degrees, so on. Uh, they represent uh, the scattering angle, the the angle at which the light, the 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 angle of the light cone, basically. Yes. These are different materials. These are the same material. It's different shapes. So the amount, the amount of the hills and valleys, how big they are, will dictate how far that you get the spread. Mm. Okay. So if you only wanted a really narrow viewing angle, you would use this super smooth one at five, you know, that only reflected things around five degrees. But if you wanted a pretty big viewing angle, you'd go down to the shapes that you see in the 80 degree. That's number. correct. Mm hmm. So these so would all have, be different. Different. Yes, uh, these would all be different uh, amount of spread that we get from the light. Mm hmm. So and we can control a spread from one to maybe 100 degree with the degree of accuracy. So you can imagine how many variation we struggle to before we see hmm, that might be a screen product. Mm. So it would have to be pretty wide for it to be as uh, useful as a home theater screen, right? Um, yeah, there is different requirements and I guess uh, three main requirements that we learn. One is very wide and have to be bright. One is a little bit more narrow, we call reflect point four. And sometimes people request even much brighter type of environment when your gain going way up. So that's what we try to accomplish and offer wide and viewing angle, medium kind of viewing angle and bright and very narrow angle and super bright. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, we're going to talk about exactly that next. Uh, but before we do, I have another sponsor to thank for this episode, which is Epson. Now, Epson's revolutionary cartridge-free Ecotank line of printers for home and office introduce a new age in printing. The Ecotank ET4550 wireless all-in-one printer doesn't use ink cartridges. Instead, it features an amazing, innovative, refillable ink tank, earning it the title of CES 2016 Innovation Awards honoree. So there's no more out-of-ink frustration. It includes up to two years of ink, equal to about 11,000 black pages or 8,500 color pages. And you can save up to 80% on ink with low-cost replacement ink bottles. It's powered by Precision Core printing technology. It has auto two-sided printing and a 30-page auto document feeder. And easy wireless printing from tablets and smartphones. All Ecotank printers deliver an unbeatable combination of convenience and value. With Epson's Ecotank line of printers, you'll have the freedom to print without running out of ink. In fact, the Epson Ecotank system was named the 2016 Small Biz Windows Printer of the Year. So visit epson.com slash ecotank today to transform the way your home, office, or work group prints. For the best combination of ease and value, turn to the Epson Ecotank printers. That's epson.com slash ecotank. And we thank Epson very much for their support of home theater geeks. Epson, exceed your vision. Okay, so we were just about to get into uh, something really interesting in my book. Of course, this is all very interesting because, after all, I'm a home theater geek. Uh, and that is the relationship between ga gain and viewing angle. And uh, whichever of you might like to take up this question, uh, and that is, tell us first of all what gain is so that we make sure everybody's on the same page. You want to take it? Gain is the uh, amount of light coming back from the screen. And uh, it's measured by light meter and measured by camera and depends uh, on your setup and uh, 
polarized glass that you put on the front, which uh, represent uh, 3D type of settings. So normally in a lab environment, we measure, it's called half circle gain and start from the center of the screen, which is light normal to the screen and goes all the way to the sides uh, in rotation of uh, 90 degree, which is give you full half circle. And the description of this gain, I guess, when gain get 50% uh, light transmission out, so that's where the gain stops. And that gives you an angle. Right. So uh, that's sometimes called the half gain angle. So if you measure right. a certain amount of light coming from straight off the screen, perpendicular right. to the screen, and then you start measuring farther and farther off axis, as it's called, at some point you'll get half as much light as you did when you were right. straight on. And that angle where that happens is called the half gain angle or the viewing angle. So the next question is, as far as I think, as far as I know, there these two things are very related. You know, the more gain there is, the shallower, the narrower, the half gain angle. Is there no way to affect that relationship? The ratio is law of physics. It probably will be difficult to affect that. Uh, but what we can do, we can improve that relationship. Uh, because most of the screens have what we call circular angles. So the light goes all over the place. Let's say in a 360 cone method. Mm -hmm. What we can do, we can, uh, we call photon harvesting. Uh, we can focus that cone of light in kind of a triangular manner. So we put some photons from top and bottom to the middle. It's still same relationship. The brighter gain, the less viewing angle, but it's greatly improved compared to any other screens. Mm -hmm. Anthony, would you like to comment? on? Yes. Okay, so if you look at most other screens, they have a Lambertian uh, emission of what happens with the light that goes in. And so we have, a, we have that, graphics to illustrate this, actually, numbers eight and nine. So if you look, you have a circular output of where the light goes. So if you imagine the light coming straight down on the left, and this is how the light will go out from the screen if it's a Lambertian screen. And most uh, regular screens are constructed so that they reflect in a Lambertian mode. So what, what we're looking at here really is imagining light coming in straight from the top on the left, in the left-hand side. And if it reflects straight out, on, straight back up, it, you're going to get maximum amount of light. And then as you go off angle, you get less and less and less light until you're at 90 degrees, you get nothing at all. Right, Correct. and you're losing that light uniformly all over the end center, right? right? And that's what the, what the, gra what the uh, graphic on the right shows is that we've got a lot of light coming back from the center and less and less as we move off to the side. In a very even, well, uh, just a very circular pattern, very even, very regular. Correct. Right. So now basically, we, if you look at in uh, mathematical terms, that's cosine of theta, which falls off. And the reason for that is, what you see as a viewer, as you go uh, more and more to from zero to 90 degrees, is that the cross section of your area seems to become smaller and smaller. And so it's a direct relationship as to how big of a cross section of area you're seeing. Mm. Okay, sure. So if you're at 90 degrees, you're looking at the screen edge on, you see essentially zero area. Correct. And then at full at, at right in front of the screen, you see maximum area. And then between them, you get less or more depending on where you are. Right. Uh, the next, the next graphic we have shows the reflect material and, uh, tell us about this. Okay. Since, uh, like we showed that we have control over our structure, we can direct the light to go more towards, uh, the audience. So wherever you're sitting, we can direct 
more of the light back. So we can't create more light, but we can direct it back to the viewer. And so since more of the light is going back to the viewer, the screen will definitely appear brighter to the viewing audience. As long as they're within a certain angle from Correct. dead center, right? Yes. Right. Yes. So we, we sell the screens so that it matches how the viewing audience is going to be configured in that room. Because we cannot do magic, right? So we use exactly the same light as any other screen comes to our screen. But what we do differently, we pack that light differently. So we send out in a very controllable manner. So your floor and your ceiling will see less lights. But you can put more guests left and right and see wide angle. Ah, so the picture on the graphic on the right shows us this. It shows us that the, that less light is reflected up and down and That's more correct. light more light comes out uh, along the sides, which actually increases the viewing angle horizontally. Now, if you were to be sitting at different heights vertically, you'd have a worse situation, right? Exactly. But what you also do, you preserve the gain because your center portion, that bright sun, still the same. So with the same gain, you have much higher viewing angle. Mm. So this is how you uh, bend the laws of physics, shall we say? <laughs> <laughs> well, as we learn, light is bendable. Ah, indeed. <laughs> <laughs> and somewhat controllable, as we've seen here. Um, so that's the difference between Lambertian or Lambertian, depending on how you say it and the reflect material. Um, I also wanted to just quickly mention something that is within your materials that, that are on your website and, and various places called bi-directional scattering distribution function or BSDF. Uh, and I'd love for one of you to explain what the heck that is. Well, as okay. you see, we like all these words. They make us feel really good and important. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, well, that's an important part of life, after all. Right. I can explain that one, Leah. Okay, so basically, uh, bidirectional scatter distribution function, as you can see, is a four-letter word, and it represents a four-dimensional function, basically. So you have two of the dimensions, which is describing the direction of the light going into a surface. So if you imagine uh, longitude and latitude, right? And mm. you imagine that you have a globe and the surface is, let's say, cutting across the equator. The light going in can be described in a longitude and latitude direction. Mm -hmm. okay. Coming back to hemisphere, right? Yeah, coming back so to hemisphere. We were talking about hemisphere. hemispheres before the show started, right? Right. So the other portions of the, uh, the two other directions are the light going out. So the light can either go back out the northern hemisphere in which it creates our screens, which is reflected, right? So yeah. that's two other. Or it can go, if it's transmissive, it can go through the southern hemisphere. And so it'll be a regular diffuser in that case. Uh, transmissive diffuser, light going yes. through it and coming out at some other angle. Right. So it'll come out the southern hemisphere for... Uh, transmissive and reflective diffusers, it'll come out the northern hemisphere. Mm -hmm. Actually, we had a question from the chat room from Creamy Corn Cob, uh, who is asking actually about the transmissive material that you guys have been working on for longer than reflective materials like screens. Uh, and the question is, do you have any involvement in augmented reality where wherein you know, you can put on a pair of glasses or a headpiece of some sort. You can see the world around you, but you can also project other images onto that material as if they were out in the real world along with real world stuff. Um, I can answer that question. Answer is yes. Um, actually, about six years before Google Glass, um, we designed augmented reality glasses for NASA. Mm. And we, I think we still have in our showroom. And as we speak today, we're actively involved in, in the projects. 
Mm, okay. So that's that's one area where you probably won't see the name of your company, but where you are, in fact, actively engaged in, in development. That is certainly a big area these days, along with virtual right. reality. And so I'm sure this that keeps area, you plenty busy. Okay. I'm sorry. Sorry. Go right ahead. Uh, this area more in relation with our holographic uh, division uh, versus diffusion division. Mm. But uh, because we are in optics and we see a lot of potentials, uh, mm -hmm. we're working on those projects for quite a few years. In fact, that, that reminds me of a question that I didn't put on my list, but I'd, I'd love to ask you is your holographic division. It's, it's in some of your materials you you talk about holographic process whereby this uh, the light shaping diffuser that we've been talking about is created, uh, but I I don't quite understand how that could be. And then the second part is what does your holographic division do? Are you actually working on say holographic television by concept anyway? Um, not exactly. Um, okay, I will explain as far as I can. Uh, so holographic uh, division is one of our government division and ah. it's mainly work on as it's called SBIR projects, which is small business innovation research. And we are working on a two, two types of holography, which is one is called CGH, which is computer generated holograms. And second, we call see through holograms. Uh, both are uh, very interesting and we produce number of articles that can use in automotive successfully to project image, for example, your stoplight out of plane and also can guide the image uh, through the uh, light guiding type of substrate. Uh, hmm. We're not specifically involved in 3D, but we was working on those projects a few years ago. <laughs> yeah, 3D uh, in the home anyway seems to have kind of, kind of um, lost its, lost its importance. Although it's still pretty important in commercial cinemas. Uh, although that reminds me, your screen. Getting back to the reflect screen, it does preserve polarization, doesn't it? Which would allow passive 3D on on this screen, right? Right. It actually works really well with the. 3D as well as 2D, so you don't have to change screen. And because of uh, gain capability and the microstructure size, 3D image is uh, super sharp and much brighter than on any other screen. Mm. Well, the, being brighter and having higher gain is really important, uh, obviously, because the 3D glasses cut so much light from reaching your eyes. Almost on the 50%. other hand... Almost 50%. Yeah, exactly. Uh, on the other hand, there aren't very many home theater projectors anyway that use passive 3D. Most of the time they use active 3D where the the glasses have are powered. They have a battery or something in them and, and they alternately open and close. The, your screen would work for that as well. But I personally would love to see uh, a projection system for the home that used passive 3D. I, LG made one at one point. I don't know if anybody's doing it currently, but I think, you know, your screen offers that capability as an option. Yeah, screen will work well with active or passive. Mm -hmm. And you will see excellent sharpness on the screen. Yeah, and yeah. We believe, like, I think it's more like a content issue versus glasses. There is not enough 3D content to watch all the time, right? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Okay, well, before we finish up, I got one more sponsor to thank for this episode, and that is Optical Cables by Corning. Corning can greatly improve your audio-video workflow with their strong, durable, and far-reaching Thunderbolt and USB 3.0 fiber optic cables. Whether you're into high-end video, photography, audio production, or computing, Optical Cables by Corning will allow you to build a convenient workspace through a superior, long-distance connection. Corning's USB 3.0 and Thunderbolt cables are incredibly strong and flexible. They have exceptional cable runs of up to 60 meters or 200 feet for Thunderbolt and 50 meters or 165 feet for USB 3. 
making it so easy to move noisy, space-consuming devices away from your workspace. You can bend and walk on Corning's cables, and even if they're tangled, it's no problem. They will keep transmitting at top speed. Optical cables by Corning will help you achieve acoustic and electrical isolation so you can enjoy a clutter-free, peaceful working environment. Now, one company that uses optical cables by Corning is Universal Audio. They rely on optical cables by Corning to achieve acoustic isolation in their studio where they test new equipment, such as their best-selling Thunderbolt audio interfaces. And I can tell you, as a previous member of the Pro Audio Press Corps, uh, that Universal Audio is one of the best companies out there. And uh, it says a lot that they rely on these optical cables by Corning. So instead of investing in multiple extenders, adapters, and cables, turn to Optical Cables by Corning to establish the connection you need with one simple, long-length cable. Optical Cables by Corning are available at all major electronics and professional AV retailers, including Apple Stores, Amazon, B&H, and more. Optical Cables by Corning are longer, thinner, lighter, and stronger. Go to OpticalCablesByCorning.com to learn more. And we thank Corning very much for their support of Home Theater Geeks. Um, <clears throat> Beatmaster in the chat room is asking a question. What product of theirs, of yours, will be most likely to come first to the mass market? I assume it's the Reflect screen. Yes, I think what you can see on... Uh website like reflect 2.5 and reflect 4 probably up to 100 inch diagonal with no seams that will be on the market first and uh, when do you expect that to happen right after a new year ah okay will you be at ces we will yes Oh, good. Well, and I look forward to uh, to seeing you there because I I'm looking forward to seeing the screen at Cedia. You had a, a small little piece, a small little screen, sort of. I guess it was half and half. It was a split screen, half of with the reflect material and half with another material, which brings up the other really important part about your your screens, which is ambient light rejection. And uh, I'd love for either of you to talk about that important aspect. Of, of this screen because uh, basically normally if you're in a if you're using a projector and you want to get the best performance out of it you really need a very well light controlled room you mean you need to have shades and blackout blinds on the windows and have it completely light controlled and completely dark which of course many people can't do it's impractical but if you have an ambient light rejecting screen that helps quite a bit so tell us a little bit about how how that happens in the reflect material. Okay, I can answer that. So remember back when we were talking about the Lambertian properties, other screens have this Lambertian properties, which means one of the things is that no matter which direction the light comes in at, then let's say the unwanted light, the way that the light exits the surface is in a Lambertian uh, mode. So our screen is different in that um, if it's coming in at a unintentional angle, then it will not get back to the audience. It will go off at, at an angle which the audience doesn't see. So this is the reason why our screen has better contrast even under ambient light conditions. Now, there are other ambient light rejecting screens, of course, that um – that basically take light coming in from, from an odd angle, not from the projector, and reflect it away from the audience, which is basically what you're doing here with this material, right? Yes, that's correct. So, so it's not a brand new thing. Uh, Lambertian uh, surfaces, such as, for example, the Studio Tex 100 from Stuart Film Screen, uh, does in fact reflect everything very evenly at all, in all directions. Uh, but as as most screens, as you increase the gain, you you narrow the viewing angle. But even so, you need some special technology to re actually reject that light coming in from, say, the lamp in the corner or the overhead light, something like that. Uh, and uh, clearly what you guys are doing solves that problem as well. 
Correct. So basically, the light that's coming from the projector is ending up where the uh, audience is, and the light coming from that specific angle has the strongest impact. And so that's the reason we have a much stronger uh, contrast, is that a lot more light is ending up to the audience that's intended, whereas most of the other ambient light doesn't end up to the audience view. And so mm. it really helps us in our brightness and contrast. Mm. Uh, what is the highest gain you can achieve with this material? I've, you, you've said, you've mentioned, Leo, you mentioned 2.5 and 4, which are pretty high already, but I think you can go even higher than that, can't you? Yes, we can. If we refocus our structures to put most of the lights towards one point, the gain can be very high. We measure as high as 18 sometimes 20, which is sound unrealistic, but that's yes. what the instrument shows. Wow. And what application could you possibly think of for a screen with a gain of 18 or 20? I don't know, probably for the super dark projection systems or nighttime goggle environment. Uh, ah, right there now. you go. Yeah, because our, you know, as you see, uh, our structures is so unique, and they produce very unique phenomena as far as reflection screen. is like a Swiss Army knife on a screen. It's 2D <laughs> and 3D, right? It's yeah. 2D and 3D. is a high gain. It's also semi-ambient um, light reflective screen. It also can be cleanable and all the other aspects of the great uh, performance. Mm-hmm. And all because we have that unique microstructure design that we design in-house, and we have first uh, reflective surface. We have the most efficiency that you can gain from the perfect mirror. Um, so all this property of the microstructure gives you capability that no other screens can. Yeah. Um, and the other thing that I found very interesting is that the... Um, the material can actually be perforated. Uh, many ambient light rejecting screens cannot be perforated, uh, but yours can, which allows you to, which allows it to become an acoustically transparent screen with speak, and you can put speakers behind it, and the sound passes through. Have you guys ever done much, done much uh, investigation into that? Yes, we did um, acoustically transparent screens, and we're working on it. But um, our first release will be. Uh, seamless, non-acoustically transparent, non-perforated screen. But we have technology to perforate screen in mass production rate. Mm. Must not be very easy, though, because of this microstructure is so critical uh, that I would think that any time you poke a pin through it, say, that, that would disrupt it. Yes, we have to design special laser drilling equipment. Ah, of course, laser drills. That's how you make the perforation. Okay, that makes sense. Right. And, and then even better, it can be mounted, this material can be mounted in uh, a retractable housing. You know, a lot of uh, ambient light rejecting screens cannot be mounted in uh, retractable housing. They have to be fixed. They have to be static. They can't be rolled up and rolled down and rolled up and down and back and forth. Uh, but your, your material can, right? Yes, material can. Uh, practically, we stay focused on releasing that fixed frame product first, but mm. we're already working on a prototypes of uh, manual and electrically retractable screens, which probably will be on the market somewhere in the end of the 2017. Mm -hmm. I, I know I'm talking about stuff further in the future. Uh, but the fact that it's possible at all, I think, is very interesting. Yeah, the substrate that we use and the um, curing process develop a very robust, durable combination. Uh, our substrate is non-stretchable, so we don't afraid to damage or reshape structures. Our substrate put it tough, so we can do a lots of interesting things using that. Uh, polycarbonate. Mm -hmm. And is the the uh, light shaping diffuser layer, that's also obviously pretty tough too, because uh, if you rolled it up or moved it around, did stuff to it, 
you, you wouldn't want to disturb that pseudo random nature of the shape, right? Material is very tough, but uh, once you apply force, you're dealing with the peaks of the mountains. So, yes, yes you, you can shave the peaks because you uh, apply first uh, force. Surface area is much smaller. Your force is much larger. I would suggest to be careful not to use sandpaper. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I think that's probably good advice. So no matter what screen you're using. <laughs> right. Right. But okay. Well, so one, one last question for you, and that is, when, as I was doing some research on your company and the products that you make and the light, uh, light shaping diffuser and so on, I was wondering if any of this material was being used or considered to be used in another application, which is the backlight system of an LCD TV. Because, as you know, in the backlight of an LCD TV, there are two different kinds. One is where the LEDs, which are the light source, are ar arranged in an array behind the screen. And that needs a diffuser, right, to diffuse the light of, from the LEDs to be very even across the screen. And the other one is LED edge lighting, where the LEDs are only along the edge of the screen and they fire in and then need what's called a light guide plate to bend the light and diffuse it as well and make a very even picture, even illumination across the entire screen. Uh, have you guys been working in that area at all yet? The answer is yes. That actually was one of our first application. Uh, we use our diffuser for uh, uh, TVs, like one of the first model of Mitsubishi TVs. We use our diffuser in many screens, included cell phones. And if you really would like to see our diffuser at work, if you're driving on the freeway and you see Dodge Durango or Ford Mustang, that's how well we homogenize the light. So to answer your question, yes, we can. And I think it will be uh, beneficial to diffuse multiple point sources. Mm, exactly. Well, that's certainly how it would work inside a TV and clearly bunches of other things. Well, thank you so much for being here. It's been a great, uh, wonderful conversation about reflection and light physics and pretty geeky stuff. But hey, we're all geeks on this bus. Um, so I want to thank you both, Leo and Anthony. Uh, thanks for staying up and sticking around. I appreciate thank you very it. much. So you can find out much more uh, about uh, the Reflect material at crystalscreens.com. And I encourage you to go over there and check it out. It's really pretty interesting stuff. You can always find me at avsforum.com. You can email me at scott at twit.tv. And you can follow me on Twitter at htgeekscott and at avsforum. You can always find previous episodes of Home Theater Geeks right here at twit.tv slash htg and on our YouTube channel, youtube.com slash twit home theater geeks. Next week, my guest geek is scheduled to be Rod Sterling, chief engineer at JVC, to talk about projectors. Now, JVC projectors have been around for a while and very highly regarded. I'm looking forward to talking to Rod about uh, his approach to designing those projectors. So I do hope you will join me. Until then, geek out.